Folks, we're really excited today to be speaking with Mark Simon from Sports Info Solutions. They are a data-rich sports site that uses and gathers lots of data from all the major sports to inform how those games are played and to some extent how tabletop sports games are played. You might have seen that Tim Plum of PT Games recently signed an agreement with SIS to get data that will inform his computer-based football games. Mark is the content lead for Sports Info Solutions, which started in 2002. Mark is a former newspaper guy like myself. I grew up in New York City, loved all the great teams, Mets, Jets, Rangers, Knicks, uh, played Stratomatic as well, and in fact uh, wrote a piece using Stratomatic's help, and it's titled Reimagining the Yankees and Giants as Average Defensive Teams. Uh, Mark, really excited to talk to you about uh, the mission of Sports Info Solutions and how data is shaping the sport and the world of gaming. Yeah, let's do it. Looking forward to it. It's been a long time since I really got into um, certainly table games and computer games, but it's it's fun to kind of remember it and to talk to people about it. SIS launches in 2002. What was the mission there and how long have you been with them? I've been with them since 2018, but I do have a good sense of the history of the company. Uh, the company was founded uh, back then by John Dewan, who previously owned Stats Inc., sold it to Fox, signed a non-compete clause that lasted for a certain amount of time, had to kind of sit and wait. Uh, and two friends of John's, uh, Bill James and Steve Moyer, uh, Bill James being baseball sabermetrician that many people are certainly familiar with. Uh, Steve Moyer is someone who became the president uh, of the company who lived in the Lehigh Valley part of Pennsylvania where it was originally headquartered. The idea behind the company, I believe, was um, the combination of, of the three of them, the idea of let's go a little deeper uh, and dig a little bit beyond the basic stats, like Stats Inc. tracked certain things, but they wanted to go further with that. In particular, they thought that there was a market inefficiency with regards to defensive information. And right away, Bill James uh, and John went to work creating a series of defensive stats that are now known as defensive run save that you probably hear on game broadcasts and read in articles. Uh, and that is the basis uh, for uh, some of the rankings in a couple of popular baseball uh, table games. Your work is influencing uh, broadcast. It's in. It's informing uh, commentators and industry sports experts. How is the data you gather filtering through the major sports, the head offices, and maybe changing the game itself? We have deals on the baseball side with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of it's like 20 to 22 teams. It fluctuates every year. Uh, they get some of our major league data. They get our minor league data. Uh, they get our international data. We cover J uh, Japan and Korea, um, not quite as thoroughly as we cover the majors, but we cover them, I think, more thoroughly than anybody else. Uh, they're receiving our data to do with what they wish. Uh, there are examples of usage that go back a little ways. If you go back to the 2014 Giants, um, this is this is a story that an anecdote that has been shared. Um, I think our charts at the time were fairly, uh, at least then, were more sophisticated than what was available when it came to defensive positioning. And there was a key at bat involving Nori Aoki in game seven of the World Series, where a Giants outfielder was positioned just right to make what would have been a tougher catch more routine. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, defensive shifting, we have uh, played a role in showing the value of that for uh, for others. Uh, in other sports, uh, we started later, so the dents are probably a little smaller. We provide uh, NFL data to, I think it's somewhere around 10 NFL teams. And uh, one of the popular things that we have that we share with them is injury information. Like if a player misses a play, uh, we note it and we note why it, it happened based on what we can see uh, from watching it on TV. Um, we also have, and this is something that will certainly go into the, the gaming uh, contract that was just signed, we have a tool where you could see something like, okay, I want to know how effective the Eagles are on runs to the left. Or I want to know how effective, just specifically how effective, where I can put a number to it, how effective is um, uh, pa Patrick Mahomes when throwing a pass 30 yards downfield. And that allows you to get, I think that's what you would call like a specificity of splits uh, that allows uh, perhaps 
a more detailed uh, player card, I think, uh, would be a good example of that. We also, um, I'll note too, that we have a basketball business. I think we supply data to six to eight NBA teams. We track every play of every game. And the easiest way to explain an example of that, where that's valuable, let's, we understand that the assist is a situation where a player makes a pass and another guy gets a shot and the shot goes in the basket. Well, if I make a pass and you're wide open, it's not my fault that you missed the shot. So we're giving credit to the player for making uh, the pass that led to an open shot. And we have a lot of statistics that are similar to that, that encompass rebounding and defense and other facets of the game that go beyond what a basic box score would have. So I think that's a long answer to your question. What is some of the hardest data to acquire? I'm just looking through your pages here and you talk a bit about how you, you gather data. I'm just wondering if you could explain a little bit your tools and methodology and what have been some of the more elusive pieces of data to acquire? So for many years, it was tough to acquire baseball positioning data uh, unless because everything that we're doing, not it, not everything but the overwhelming majority of what we collect we're collecting from watching the game the same way that you're watching the game uh on tv so we are at the mercy of tv camera people uh all around the world and with baseball you don't always see uh where the second baseman is before a pitch was thrown or where the third baseman is or the left fielder or the right fielder and uh that made things difficult when it came to defensive analysis Major League Baseball has since improved things such that um, access to such information as to where guys are positioned is a little bit more readily available now for the people that are in our world, maybe not publicly, uh, but we can see certain things uh, that allow us to uh, have more informed and detailed statistics. So that would be, I think that's the, that's like the best example. And the NFL has that kind of thing too, with all 22 uh, where you can see the the view of the field from like the highest level of the stadium. Those are the kinds of things that have been uh, tricky to get in the past that we have access to now. Do you work directly with the leagues? How do you, uh, you partner with other folks? Do you rely on others to kind of corroborate your data or share some knowledge? We have arrangements with players associations um, and we have relationships with the league as well. In fact, um, our former president, Ben Jedlovic, uh, left us to work for Major League Baseball. Uh, so that helped with regards to establishing a good relationship there. Um, we're, like, we're not in the business of comparing with competitors, say. But, um, and it's interesting because particularly with baseball defense stuff, there are differences. And sometimes I get very frustrated by those differences, uh, but you just kind of have to accept the fact that um, this is an imperfect science. And um, we, we work very hard within the scope of what we have to get what we can. We rely on others to assist us when that comes into play. Um, but yeah, for the most part, uh, it's, it's us on our own for a lot of stuff. Do you have patents surrounding your data collection methodology or do you uh, have rights to or maintain rights to the data that you collect as proprietary to SIS? That's a good question. Um, I don't have a specific answer to that. Everything is uh, that we do pretty much is stored in SQL, uh, SQL databases. And that goes back many years. And someone trying to replicate that would face considerable challenges uh, just in accumulating the data. And I want to give I want to give a shout out to to uh, the people that are actually doing the work. We have what we call video scouts. They're seasonal employees. Uh, they're usually not long out of college. There are a few exceptions, but uh, then there are some students as well. They are watching the games and your assignment might be, okay, I got to watch uh, at one o'clock the Hanshin Tigers and the Yamiuri Giants. Uh, and then the next day you come in and your assignment might be to watch a game between the Reading Fighting Phils and the Bingle Binghamton Rumble Ponies. So you could have any number of things uh, on your plate. Uh, and those people do very good work. It's a grinded out kind of job. The reward for it comes down the road. We have employees that are working for major league teams uh, across the sport. The president of the Rays, Eric Neander, is one of our alums. Uh, there are people in the analytics departments for the twins uh, that are that were prominent uh, in that world. There are uh, the, the pitching strategy coach, new position in Major League Baseball, pitching strategy coach for the Baltimore Orioles. And 
I believe uh, similar, I don't know if it's that exact title, but also the Houston Astros, Ryan Klimek and Tommy Kawamura are former SIS video scouts uh, who went on, they're now on the field, uh, which is amazing to me. Uh, like, I, I almost feel like, like, you know, for all the video scouts, they're one of us kind of, uh, kind of thing. And that's really cool. And um, in a lot of cases, those are former college players or high school players that are well-educated on the game. And the rules that they have to follow are pretty strict. Like there's a list of like, okay, this, uh, one of the things that we do is we chart what we call good fielding plays and defensive misplays. And all right, this is an instance where a guy slipped and fall. This is another instance. This is another instance. This is one where we don't score it that way. Um, so yeah. Um, shout out to our video scouts. That's awesome. That's yeah. You know, that's brings up a great point. Your, your internal quality control. You know, we talk about NFL statisticians and, you know, the, the guidance is on deciding say whether a mobile quarterback is taking off on a designed run or a design pass, you know, you must have, uh, how, how do you evolve your QC standards? What winds up happening is that the people that were video scouts, some of them go on to teams. Some of them continue to work for us in different levels of that role. So they just kind of come up the ladder. So the people that are on that second level know what the first level was like. Uh, and they uh, they understand. Um, and then the, the other thing is like, there are people like me, there are people like uh, in our R&D department that'll, that'll say things like, hey, we caught this. And this seems to be a trending error uh, in our uh, coverage this year. I, I actually, I found one like two weeks ago uh, and it turned it, it turned out that it was, we we're changing some rules with regards to things. Um, so yeah, the, the, the quality control here is pretty strict. And I have to give a shout out to uh, Ron Pizar Jr. who uh, has taken the old football game pay dirt forward under the title uh, data driven football as as your crew are watching games he's watching games every week and and creating his team cards so that he's got them out right at the end of the season and it really is i'm sure he's you know he's he's kind of watching the games kind of with that that critical eye that you are as well and it's just really painstaking so we all thank you for doing the kind of work yeah, yeah. let me say i can't do that job yeah to, to be a video scout you gotta be really good you have to be really focused um they had us try it just to show us what it was like so we would know how the uh, you know how the other world lives and i was like oh god like it's, it's not for me you talk about going you know, watching watching the video Let's go back to watching the film. You know, John sure. Turney and Nick Webster a couple of years ago finalized their uh, unofficial sack research for the 1960 to 1981 NFL seasons. And a lot of that entailed a lot of film watching. And, and uh, you know, John Turney has his pro football journal. He talked about a game where the Niners in 1960 pulled out the shotgun. And so uh, Big Daddy Lipscomb was kind of roaming around <laughs> off the line as a, as a kind of in a, almost in a three, four linebacker spot. And I wonder, do you have at SIS any plans to go back and kind of gather data from previous games, seasons, you know, classic games to try to provide more data insights like cold hard football facts used to look at things in a particular way? I can tell you that I would love that. Uh, I would be shocked if that ever happened, though. That requires uh, a considerable amount of work. And I guess, the, guess quite frankly, like the this is this will sound kind of selfish, but like the money's not there in that sort of thing. It's there for for like me because I I love the idea of let's let's watch Game Six of the '86 World Series and you tell me what the chances were that Bill Buckner could have fielded that ball. Uh, but uh, I don't think that the money is there to to do that another uh, to do that uh, much at all. Unfortunately, how do folks? approach you to work with you and what are the kind of you know you're, you're talking about leagues and teams on the one hand down to you know pretty much a one or two man shop uh, creating a game for the computer i mean how do folks work with you and how do you work with them to create a package a data package that works a lot of what we do is kind of like customized to the individual want uh, across baseball we're known like if uh, the, you know, we, if we go to um, the Detroit Tigers or the Milwaukee Brewers or whoever and say, Hey, um, we'd like to speak with you about our stuff. 
that's a meeting we can get uh, because of 20 years in the business. And chances are someone within that organization has worked with us in some way. I think that's a little harder on the NFL and NBA sides. Our head of uh, NBA is Jake Lose, uh, and Jake used to work for the Phoenix Suns as their head of analytics. So he knows people in that world. And uh, I think they do it like you know any other business would. They reach out, they see if there's interest, and then interest begets more interest. Um, and I know that off of the first, the first thing that we offered NBA wise was related to the NBA draft. And I'm pretty sure that people who were in those organizations spread out and the next season, you had the potential for additional uh, clients. With regards to games, as far as I know, we've been with like Strat for a very long time. I don't know the full details on that. Um, there are one or two other companies that are with us. And uh, I was very pleased to see uh, that a, a football gaming company uh, had signed with us. I presume they found us just through our reputation. That brings up uh, an excellent poll that a magazine called Sports Sim Magazine by S.T. Patrick and his wife, Jen Henson. They posed the question on their Facebook group, what stats-based sports sim are you playing the most? What is the most popular? Now, in the world of APA, of course, baseball rules the roost. They came out uh, 10 years before Strat in 1951. Uh, they're set kind of based on and improving upon the game national pastime of of 1930 thereabouts the overwhelming response among the respondents was 64 percent play baseball and then the football the gap to football was down to 10 percent you know and i and folks say well it's because baseball has all this data it's the easiest sport to get data for more complete data you mentioned saber we interviewed their ceo scott bush last year before their uh, conference and uh, i just wonder what you're taking you talked about how the different sports and the different types of analytics and i just wonder what your take on the completeness of data might be for these individual sports as a statistical package it seems like baseball is just a perfectly formed thing and football we're getting there you know with you know these quarterbacks you know throwing direction of the field and distance on the field and, and that's you know direction of the play things like that but your take on that perception that baseball really is the most complete data package out there yeah, it's funny. I can remember back when I was a kid trying to play um, status pro basketball. And I just, it, to me, it wasn't the same experience. Um, and maybe it's be, maybe it has something to do with, um, well, the combination of baseball just kind of lends itself to to that from a statistical perspective. Um, but also there's so many moving parts in basketball and football um, that it doesn't, maybe it doesn't replicate as well on um to a tabletop experience, I don't. I don't know. It's been a while since I, I played. I always felt like um, Stratomatic Basic, like you could pull it right out of the box, and in ten minutes you could be playing, and you'd be playing a, what I think is a fairly enjoyable game. I don't know that you necessarily have that with uh, football and basketball. That's. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know that I have a great answer to your question, but that's that's my take on it. No, thank you. And and just to be clear about your gaming history, your dad got you moving from uh, Strat Basic to Advanced pretty quickly. And you, <laughs> platooning, if you would explain platooning to me. Yeah, <laughs> no, so it's, it's funny. I can remember when I was 10, we got it. Uh, and I can remember, I can actually picture going to get it. And this is close to 40 years ago. Um, and it being a big deal. And my dad teaching me all of the elements uh, of it. And then he didn't want to play basic. He wanted to play advanced. So he made sure that his son understood platooning and left, right splits and defense and all these different things. Um, and I got very into it. I can, I can still remember with Strat uh, that the closest I came to a no hitter in three years of playing intensely, like every day was Don Mossy of the 1961 Tigers. And I was the, I'm sure I was the only 10 or 11 year old on my block who knew who Don Mossy and his huge ears was. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then I graduated to micro league baseball, which still to this day, I love so much. It was responsible for me learning a lot of baseball history. Um, 
I played thousands upon thousands upon thousands of games. Mickey Tettleton is still like a hero to me because he had a pennant winning home run, uh, which is kind of absurd. Then I played Diamond Mine for a few years. I like to say that I was ahead of my time with Diamond Mine because uh, when I drafted, we were drafting off you know major league. Uh, teams. Uh, I drafted a closer for the ninth inning, and I drafted a closer for the eighth inning, and I made sure that I had multiple guys for the seventh inning, and my bullpen had like Mariano Rivera and Trevor Hoffman, and uh, I was very cognizant of the strengths and weaknesses of my opponent, and Chris Peters, a left-handed pitcher who probably shouldn't have been starting a playoff game, started one for me and won it because the other guy had a team that couldn't hit lefties. Um, So I take my, I I took it very seriously. Uh, It was definitely a, a heavy time consumer uh back in the day uh, i'm a little removed from it now but it's it's fun to reminisce about it certainly do you have a favorite era of sports uh or you know by sport baseball football etc hockey ba- basketball the uh, ideal time for me is when i was uh from i guess from 11 to 19 which covers the 86 Mets and the 94 Rangers, but a lot of other teams too. The Mets teams of the late, the mid and late eighties were all excellent. The Rangers teams certainly had their chances in those, uh, in those years. Um, and I just feel like 1980s baseball in particular, it was two and a half hours. You knew what you were getting into when you, when you went there in terms of time frame, uh, speed was an important part of the game, but power was significant too. No one was juicing in any way. Um, and it, it felt very legitimate in the way that it was played. And you got to see guys like, like the Dwight Goodens and the Daryl Strawberries, uh, or certainly that's, that's my era right there. I do want to go back to this project you conducted with uh, Stratomatic and I'll put the link in the description here, reimagining the 2022 Yankees and giants as average defensive teams. And I want to talk about, you know, sample size and simulations. Could you walk us through a little bit how that project came about and the, the cutoff for how many Sims you ran there? I reached out to Stratomatic who's been, uh, business partner of ours for a while because i wanted to like we say if you're familiar with our stats we say things like this team ranked fifth in defensive run saved with 70 and this team ranked first with 102 and this team ranked 27th with negative 40 and i wanted to see how the actual number compared to the real number so We took the 2022 Yankees, who were the best defensive team by our numbers that year, and the 2022 Giants, who were the worst defensive team by our numbers that year, and we said, let's imagine every player on that team is average at everything defensively. Same roster otherwise, but they're just average. They're zeros in our world. And Strat was able to run 50 simulations because of the time constraints involved in trying to do this and then run a full simulation. And they found that uh, the Yankees defense improved on average by seven wins and the Giants, uh, I'm sorry, decreased by seven wins because they went from great to average. So they went from an 101 win team to a 94 win team. Still very good, but down a little bit. The Giants uh, with their real life defense were a 77 win team they jumped to an 82 win team. So it was worth five wins to them to be better than what they were, to be an average defensive team, as opposed to a lousy defensive team that they were. We found out what it was worth in runs, the Giants defense, uh, whatever number we put. Okay. That's, that's a theoretical number in actuality, good being an average defensive team instead of a terrible defensive team, save them 40 runs uh, over the course of a year for the Yankees being a great defensive team was worth about 60 runs uh, to them in actuality, like actual gameplay as opposed to theoretical numbers. Um, So yeah, that's, that's where it came out. And the 50 simulations instead of 10,000, where you see, you know, these guys on fan graphs or other sites that are saying, okay, we're running a million simulations. Strat didn't have the time for that. I don't blame them. Uh, They ran 50 and uh, I was happy with what they got us. You touched a little bit on an area talking about the, you know, popularity of baseball versus football and other games and the reality of the experience. And I wonder in your time in this data rich environment and this, you know, deep analytical approach to sports. If you found that there have been perceptions about a team or a player, he always did this. He was a great inside runner, or he was a great pitcher in this circumstance. And the data 
ultimately didn't bear that out, maybe busted a myth. <laughs> so the biggest example of this in our world, and the one that we still quote even many years later, is we take Derek Jeter and we basically pull him apart defensively and say that he shouldn't have won any gold gloves, uh, which gets some interesting reactions from Yankee fans. I'm sure Derek Jeter doesn't particularly like it either. Uh, but but that's the big one. And Bill James did this in like six different ways. And every way that he did it, it, it was pretty clear. And the idea was, was pretty much that because of how Derek Jeter played defense, the Yankees were giving up an exorbitant number of hits up the middle. I think it was for the most part. Um, and the jump throw plays that he was making in the shortstop third base hole didn't make up for all the times that he was just missing balls. So that's our, um, that's our big one. That's a little, uh, you know, a few years back, certainly. Um, there are things that come up uh, every year, I think, with regards to, evaluation of players i think for fans in particular in baseball and i'm sticking to baseball because it's it's where i feel particularly strong center fielders every fan thinks that their center fielder is the best defensive center fielder in baseball that's not actually true um the kevin kiermeyers of the world and the michael a taylors of the world are the best and you know your guy might be like 12th he might look great i think that's what happens a lot you get the guy that looks great and that makes a lot of great defensive plays but uh in the end he's not necessarily converting all of the ones that he should be converting um, i'll give you another example of this kind of in reverse and i think i think there's a pretty healthy respect for cabrian hayes on the pirates and how good he is defensively um but the way that he's good defensively and this takes a little parsing of the data to figure it out is not because he makes the great diving play and the really spectacular play we actually found that he doesn't make those at a particularly high rate but what he does is he's so quick like going to his left that he makes what is a really hard play for for most third basemen look really easy. Um, and like you're, when you see it on TV, you're just like, oh, okay. Um, and you don't necessarily get an appreciation for that. Like, oh, wow. He's able to do something that a lot of other guys aren't able to do. He's able to make that look easy. Uh, and I think that that's cool uh, that the defensive numbers are able to do something like that. Do you gather data from any sensors on players in actual situations and could you foresee a time where if you were doing something like that, players could then use that data to uh, show that they're actually meeting higher performance uh, metrics that might influence actually their their pay, their contracts, things like that? So you're talking about like if we put like tags on players? I don't see us doing that. I have a feeling that if anyone did that, that would be an MLB like thing um, that, because – it would require incredible levels of cooperation from the players association that I don't think, I don't know that an outside company is just going to be able to get something like that. So I, I don't think that, that that's happening anytime soon. We're just going, we're just going wild here with the, uh, <laughs> in the world of data. <laughs> no, but what's happening now too is AI is uh, allowing for certain things to be done that, uh, that haven't been done before. And, um, and with the addition of certain camera angles, uh, more precise measurements can be taken. And this is true for all three of the sports, baseball, basketball, football. Um, and I'm actually going to a presentation an hour, like an, uh, 20 minutes after we tape, uh, that will explain what we're looking to do uh, with artificial intelligence. And I think that companies that are doing things with that stuff are going to move ahead. And those that aren't are probably going to move behind because that's that seems to be where the business is headed. Awesome. You anticipated my question perfectly about AI and how you're about, you know, are you using that to go back and maybe reparse your data? And AI can achieve things that the human mind simply cannot, right? Yep. And I will tell you that uh, I will say, yes, we are. And if you follow up with how are you doing that, I will say, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'm going to this meeting to learn about. There you go. That seems to be consensus for just about every industry out there right now. But yeah. boy, you have to be there. Well, that's good. So you had mentioned you're editing some NFL uh, scouting reports now. Are there any other things that are on the immediate horizon for SIS that you can reveal? 
let me give a plug for that because that's an, an important part of um, something that we do. We do. We're partnered with the 33rdteam.com, which is a website in which coaches, former executive scouts, write articles and produce videos evaluating NFL players and teams. And we are 200 players deep into NFL draft scouting reports on that website. We'll have over 300 by the time the the draft uh, comes to be. They're pretty good. They're very comprehensive. They're written as if you're the GM. Uh, So when you're reading them, the language is very sophisticated from a a sports perspective. Um, And they come also with the data that we have uh, that can either back up some of what's uh, said scouting wise or might contrast with it uh, a little bit, uh, but it's all there for people to get. So that's a, uh, that's certainly a big one. Other than that, I'll give a plug for something that we've got that I think is pretty cool. We provide umpire data to a variety of MLB broadcast crews. If you watch a game broadcast by the A's, the White Sox, um, this year, I think we're adding another uh, team potentially uh uh, in Philadelphia, uh, the Yankees, and maybe, and if you watch the Giants, it gets talked about a lot. We don't necessarily, we're not as tied into that, uh, but also the Tigers uh, to an extent too. If you watch those games, you will hear the announcers and see the announcers discuss what the umpires do. And not necessarily the idea of right and wrong, but just trend. Okay, Doug Eddings, his strike zone is this big. Or um, Alfonso Marquez, his strike zone is this big, like much smaller. Um, And we can tell you who the big zone umpires are and who the small zone umpires are. And it adds something to the broadcast that you might hear about in the first inning. You might hear about it in the eighth or ninth inning. Uh, And I think it's something that's pretty cool that, that is somewhat unique to what we do. You had mentioned that the NFL is particularly interested in injury information. I wonder if you gather anything regarding equipment usage particularly uh you know helmets and safety equipment and correlations there do you you shy away from trying to draw a proportion correlation yeah i don't i don't think we're doing anything with that our injury coverage is extremely comprehensive down to in baseball foul balls hitting catchers masks um, is something that, that we cover, but I don't think we're doing anything with equipment. Wondering if you might uh, help folks, uh, uh, us civilians kind of navigate the SIS website for any uh, things that they might be able to, to view kind of that are open to the public. You have a podcast. We have them for baseball and we have them for football. Um, boy, we've got a, uh, this is going to take a minute. We've got a fair amount of stuff. We have a baseball podcast that I host where for the most part, I interview players uh, about how they do what they do defensively. We decided to create like a podcast that was devoted to defensive appreciation because that's a lot of our metrics have been geared towards that. Um, so it's cool. Our next, uh, we just released one, actually it was related to Black History Month where we talked to uh, a couple of people about how they integrate data into what they do. Uh, our next one will actually be with Cleveland Guardian second baseman Andres Jimenez. Uh, and he was cool. He had uh, a couple of fun. There were, he said something that was somewhat unexpected for me that was uh, really neat to hear him talk about. Football wise, our podcast is hosted by Bryce Rossler and he brings on thought leaders uh, in the industry to talk about different football evaluation things, uh, whether it's evaluating players or teams or predicting games or looking at the best quarterbacks in the NFL draft or things of that sort. If you go to the Sports Info Solutions website, sportsinfosolutions.com, you can find the podcast there. You can also find our articles. Uh, a lot of them are written by me. Some of them are written by my colleagues as well. We write about things that we think would be interesting to people who follow baseball data and football data. And we're going to have some basketball ones too. It's basically a, a resource for us to show off what we do. If you're a business and you're interested in learning more about us, there are links at the top of the page, I think, for solutions. Uh, that allows you to learn more about our baseball, football, and basketball all departments. The one other, two other websites I will give a plug for are fieldingbible.com, which is where all our defensive stats are stored, and the SIS Data Hub for football. SISdatahub.com. That's more advanced NFL splits for those that are interested in that sort of thing. We also have Data Hub Pro, which is a more advanced version of that. You can get a, you can request a trial of that for a week. It's a really cool tool uh, and it's a little uh, expensive, but I, I do recommend it to people. I know you have to run to another presentation, but a couple of quick uh, personal uh, questions. Sure. The movie Moneyball, what's your take on that? <laughs> 
Oh man, uh, this is funny. Uh, uh, it's it's okay. Uh, it is what it is. It doesn't mention the A's pitching, which I think is a, is a significant miss. My biggest issue with that movie is actually I get very frustrated watching movies that have a million different camera shots where they're constantly going from like, you'll see close up of Brad Pitt, close up of Jonah Hill, uh, close up of the guy playing Ron Washington, close up of Scott Hat of the guy playing Scott Hatterberg. And that just drove me crazy watching it, uh, which is a different uh, issue than most people had with that movie, which was that they ignored the A's pitching. I think it conveys the 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 scout uh, the scout stat disconnect of the time that gradually uh, has waned a bit uh, considerably. I think as a New York City native sports fan, obviously, what are the one or two pieces of data? the stats that you most proudly trumpet or your teams or you hear is like, well, you know, if you're in that barstool conversation, you know, such and such did such and such. Did you know that? And um, you know, you, you carry that with pride. For me, that's that the 1986 Mets win 108 and 54. And uh, in terms of national league teams, uh, if I remember right, I'm looking at it here. I think that lasted 36 years as the best, National League team record uh, in baseball. Uh, and within my lifetime, I think it was the best National League record until the Dodgers uh, won 111 in 2022. So the 86, the 86 Mets, um, there was a documentary about them on ESPN uh, a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> if I could write it from a, a fan's perspective, that, that's a, that was a life-changing team for me, and that team is a really big deal. Uh, so that would be number one. In terms of like sabermetric stuff, um, there are a lot of metrics actually that uh, promote Keith Hernandez for the Baseball Hall of Fame that I think are pretty good. You can find them at places like Baseball Reference. I am a Keith Hernandez for the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, backer in just about every possible way. Uh, uh, so I think those two would, would be at the top for me. Thank you, sir. Mark Simon, Sports Info Solutions, sportsinfosolutions.com. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work. We can't wait to dig into the site and uh, come back to the show with uh, some more insights whenever you're free. Cool. Appreciate what you're doing for uh, sports gaming. Thank you very much.